from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're reading from verse 11 and into the first couple of verses of the next chapter. The NIV headed, The Ministry of Reconciliation. Since then we know what it is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We're not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us, so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God was making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor I heard you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, you tell us that it's all about what we think. That it was our thinking that was distorted and perverted in the garden. And the human race suffering from that ever since. But the truth became a living person. The word hand dwelt among us. You, Lord Jesus, tell us that if we're your disciples, we will obey your commands. Then we'll know the truth and it will set us free. And that you, the son, if you set us free, we're free indeed. And that we were alienated from your enemies in our minds. And that by being transformed by the renewal of the mind, we know who you are, Father, what your good, perfect, and pleasing will is. We just pray for all of us here this morning that in some measure that will be true of us. We'll be led into all truth in Jesus' name. Amen. So... For visitors, we're doing a, a, a sort of series um, based on 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, where Paul's talking about building on his work. And he said, there's no other foundation. There's only one foundation. There's a quote there. For no one can lay any other foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. And um, the previous series was looking at our, our lives and faith from a more of an individual um, perspective, finishing the race well, how are we doing in our race? And this one's more of a corporate one, the big picture, the bird's eye view, so to speak. And it's something of the fruit of my sabbatical, which I hope is a, a blessing. So let's go into the text that we're looking at today. And as I always do, I'll draw bits out by highlighting them. And it's very interesting that before we look at that highlighted bit, if you can see it, actually, the contrast isn't brilliant. The fact that Paul's talking about, look, this is not what is we see, it's what's in the heart. And then up here, he talks about if we're out of my, our mind, as if, as some saying, as if 
he's mad by what he's suggesting. The gospel isn't reasonable to the Jewish nation who was expecting a, a super messiah like David and being able to come in and drive the Romans out, for him to die like a cursed criminal on a cross was an offense, we're told at the beginning of Coloss uh, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. And to those who are intellectual and think God's so amazing that he's going to come up with something that will wow us all, it's foolishness. So God was pleased through the preaching of the word, even though man couldn't find out and understand what God's doing through human intellect. He made possible through the foolishness of preaching. So like I've, I've already hinted in our prayer, what you think about God is all about how you will respond to him. Same for everybody. And where did you get your thinking from? Did it come out of the womb with you? Where have you acquired not only what you believe, but your stance towards that and others who think differently on some points? Because the way that you respond to them will be taught to you as well. Some more fundamental belief traditions tend to dig in and defend and become entrenched. Some more liberal just let anything go and will listen to anything whether uncritically, whether it's from the world or not. If it gives some sort of semblance of freedom and liberation when it might not be anything more than just a religious version of rampant individualism which doesn't take into account our own way that we plug not only into human society but into all of creation. So this is massive. So what Paul says sounds crazy. So there's this um, bit in the middle here. It's all important, but we haven't got time to go through it all. For Christ's love compels us. It says it all. Christ's love compels. Anything you think and about Christian faith and then therefore practice should be compelled by the love of God, love of Christ. Because we're convinced that one died for all. This has been a theme over the last three weeks. This all, this sort of inclusiveness, this bird's eye view that the, present, uh, that the gospel gives us. And therefore all died. And he died for all. Some traditions will put some in there. Or some sort of variations on traditions will put some in there. That those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again. This is pretty straightforward, isn't it? So I'll just read that again, although we'll come across it later. Because we are convinced that one died for everybody, all, regardless of race, gender, intellectual ability, economic standing, whatever, and therefore all died. And he died for all. Well, he died for the sins of the whole world. We know that, don't we? So let's just go on to the next passage, uh, well, next part, which is astonishing. In the, in the light of that, in the light of all, Paul no longer looks at a human being, any human being, like he used to, especially not Jesus. And we knew he used to look at Jesus as somebody who thought differently from him, somebody who was blaspheming. God blaspheming? So Paul thought he had it right. His credentials were amazing. He was taught by the best. He, was a, he, he said in terms of the law, he was faultless. And he persecuted Jesus because Jesus was full of faults in terms of the way that he thought Jesus ought to believe and practice. So from now on, we regard no one, nobody, Regardless of gender, race, regardless of intellectual means, whether a slave or whether they're a slave owner, whether it's Caesar, whether it's the high priest, whether it's the person next door, no one he looks at like he used to before the love of Christ compelled him. How about you? How does the gospel so reshaped your thinking but that when you look at human beings, you look at them in an entirely different way than you did before. 
a, 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 an entirely different way. Because that's what Paul's saying here. And he goes on, it's from the worldly point of view. Don't look at anybody from a worldly point of view, from a critical point of view, from a different tribe point of view, from a, oh yeah, they're in my tribe, I'll accept them, but those I won't point of view. Because that's what he's saying. Worldly point of view is all about division. Remember, it all started in the garden. It's the woman. You put ear with me. Division between man and woman. And yet they're meant to be one. Division. The woman says it was the serpent between man and creation. And then that's accentuated by the fact that Adam is told instead of just being able to cruise around plucking the fruit to eat, He'll have to work the ground and it will produce thistles. And it's the sweat of his brow. Something so massive happened because the thinking changed. And it turns out that the knowledge of good and evil was actually distorting human understanding of reality in themselves. So they separated themselves from God and hid. You have separated yourself from God outside of Christ because in Adam all separate and it's a delusion it's an illusion it's a distortion of reality because God is never separate in him we move and have our being Paul tells the Athenians if he the Psalm um, 139 quoted already knit me together in my mother's womb there's nowhere I can do to flee from you you might want to say oh that's only the people of God But no, it doesn't. It affirms that everybody has their whole entire life stretched out, and God knows it. Every word that's going to proceed from their mouths. It's massive. So this separation vibe, this us and them, this good and evil, right and wrong, we'll decide what's good and what is evil, and it's all about separation and difference in a world which God looked at and said, it's very good. We suddenly realize from our own evaluation, that it's not so good. Because that person isn't so good as I think they ought to be. So, from though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. An overlap. The old is gone and some of the new is here, or some of the old is gone and all of the new is... The old is gone. The new is here. Anybody in Christ is new and the old has gone. Do with that what you want. You can do theological gymnastics and try and make it mean what it doesn't. (laughs) Let's move on. (laughs) Some highlights. And all this is from God, not from us. It's crazy. All this is from God who reconciled us, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. Well, he's already done it. And gave us the ministry of reconciliation, Paul. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. My goodness, the ministry of reconciliation doesn't require the sins to be I don't know, dealt with by the individual apparently. While we were still enemies, Christ died for us. Of course, we all agree with that because he died for the sins of the whole world. How that works out on an individual level, how that works out in the sort of, well, what's the final deal? What's that game end plan for me as a person or that person over there, whatever? We're not going into that right now. We're just looking at this epic bird's eye view that God's been reconciling without counting sins against people. That's crazy. That's unfair. It doesn't make sense. No wonder Paul was called mad. You're all looking very pensive there. (laughs) We are therefore Christ's ambassador as though God were making his appeal through us. God making an appeal? What is the appeal that God makes? We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. The problem's not on his side. Never was, was it? We turned away from him. Became enemies in our minds. 
We sorted it. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him, in Christ, we might have the, be the right, become the righteousness of God. Notice that. Isn't that a bit odd? Sin. He who had no sin, it says the whole sins of the whole world were put upon him. We tend to think of sin as sins. No, the activity comes from something which God calls sin that he put on Jesus. They manifest in actions. But it's like this, almost given a personality, just like way back at the beginning when Cain killed Abel. And, you know, God came across and said to Cain, where's your brother? And instead of going, oh, I'm found out. He wasn't cowering. There was no fear there. He said, am I my brother's keeper? And he said, the ground is crying out. And we get that hint of the profound nature of our distorted minds and our connection with creation being corrupted. And look at where that's led us now. And he said, watch out. You do right, not wrong, because sin is crouching at your door, waiting to exploit you. This thing, sin, that Jesus took upon him. Yeah, all the manifest activities, your sins, my sins, too. But we were slave to sin, not slave to sins. Slave to this thing. Well, it must be seeing things wrong and acting in accordance with that distorted way. So, and it goes, as God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. So the, the, the grace is on offer. It's available. The, your sins have been covered by Jesus. It's, it, the capacity for you to be able to turn and to receive that is there. So this grace, this grace, God's reconciliation while you were still not all cleaned up and ready. Don't hear the gospel in vain. That means don't let it be unpotent and powerful and work in your life and transform you. Don't ignore it. Don't turn away from it. Repenting means to turn from the wrong way of walking, behaving, seeing things, and start walking in the right way. And then he goes on down. Because I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. So, remember... A couple of weeks ago, we were looking at this passage, the massive one about through him, that's Jesus, all things were made. He's the firstborn of all creation. He sustains all things. All things are for him, this massive thing. And at the end, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. It's all about the cross and it's all about the whole of creation. The cosmos, not just human beings. Even if you lead the way and I lead the way. So it's this all, this huge bird's eye view of this massive thing Jesus has done. So for the benefit of those who, who, who um, are visitors, we've been using this infographic on the history of Christianity. And I like to provocatively go into it by Jesus' um, prayer in chapter 17 of John. Um, praise for himself, praise for the disciples with him, and then those who will come after him through their witness, which is us, and all the other people over the last 2,000 years. And he prays this, Father, I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, in, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them, even as you've loved me. The world will know when the church is unified. So, so we start over here, and then we've got 2,000 years of church history. And it starts off down here. And this is any movement that has Jesus as part of their movement. So there's cults in here, there's Gnosticism, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, and things. Wherever Jesus is a component, a serious component, what they're doing. But also in there with all the Christian, all the Christian denominations as well. So We've got this first thousand years where there's just the Latin church centered in Rome and the Orthodox church centered in the eastern end of the, the um, uh, Mediterranean. And they sort of get on okay, but then the, the, uh, about 1054, the Latin 
bishop in Rome wanted to be in charge of all of them, and there was a bit of a disagreement over a line in one of the creeds, which was down here. And all the creeds were all about Jesus' identity. Who is he? Who, who, who's God? The Trinity. So it was all about that. And so for the, for the last thousand years, they've more or less gone. You've got different expressions of Orthodox Church in terms of Syrian, Coptic. You've got Greek and Russian, obviously, and others. But they all more or less respect one another. They're not split and divided. But, of course, the Catholics, around 500 years ago, the Catholics decided to protest. And then we get this amazing tree of division and redivision and stuff in the Protestant church. And I've said something about the DNA of not liking what something's like and then feeling you've got permission to leave that and to go off and start something new. And... <laughs> 99.99% of the time, you're not super blessed. And then somebody else down the line comes across something else. And it just seems to be there as part of that. So is Jesus' prayer being answered? Because God answers Jesus' prayer. The worldly point of view, institution, organization, worldly point of view, is going in the opposite direction in the church. I just rest my case with history. It's becoming more disunified in terms of administration. It's crazy, isn't it? It's like Jesus going, oh no, what are they doing? And yet Jesus is the foundation. And Paul says, be careful how you build on that. If you do it with the precious stuff, that's going to be tested, thumbs up, it will get through the testing fire. But if you do it with dodgy stuff, then it's going to be tested and burnt up. Mercifully, if you do the building with dodgy stuff, you'll still get through, it says. But what you've laid down is going to be burnt up. How much of that is going to be torched? <laughs> if whatever is torched, what will it reveal? It will reveal the answer to that prayer. And it won't be who can do what and what vestments or how the communion table ought to be done or not. It won't be what women can or can't do. It won't be. It will be one thing and one thing only, love. The love of Christ, the command which shows who his real disciples are. So let's move on from that because that's why I'm introducing this idea about what do you believe? What do you think? And if you think something, if you checked out all the others so you're satisfied they haven't got anything right, that you've got the best understanding of Jesus is and what it means to follow him, because I certainly am, that, that humbles me. That humbles me. So let's just move on. That's the, because this is well up online, that's just ticking the box and doing all the proper stuff in terms of copyright and permission to use that. So... I've got some ambitious slides to show you here to make a point. Some of you will go, yeah, I love this, because you like that more than words. But let's just say this is the tradition that you've settled in, and you're happy with it, okay? And you're aware of other stuff, but you more or less think, okay, they're a bit dodgy. He's got a dodgy cross, haven't they? <laughs> but not sure about that. Not sure about it being, oh, look, there's a dodgy cross up there that we can only just see in there. Don't know much about them, but I'm happy, and I'm told that this is what it's all about, and I'm faithful and true, and yeah, okay? Well, when you see a diagram like the one we've just seen, when you get the bird's eye view, what do you actually see? <laughs> and who do they think they are? Big cross like that. So... There will be emphasis, and the emphasis will be on some sort of Christian practice, some tradition. Some of it's got like thousands of years of juggernaut weight be behind it. Some of it might be brand new and breaking away from that and be really a fresh new expression. But whatever it is, it'll have an emphasis. How communion should be done, who's going to do it, what's the cross all about. Um, the early church, the cross wasn't about punishment. It was about Christ redoing and mending what Adam had done. And it wasn't about punishment. It wasn't about God's anger. Did you know that? That penal substitution theory of atonement was birthed 
by Calvin and those at the Reformation. And is so, that's why it's so prevalent part of the Protestant church. But also in the early church, there was also this idea that Christ came and the cross was all about him liberating us from slavery. Because it's the only words Jesus actually articulates himself. Paul explains it in lots of ways, but Jesus himself, when he, anything he said, well, what did he say was the meaning of his death? It was says, I've come to seek and save the lost, that my life might be a, a ransom for many. And then you have problems, because who's the ransom paid to? If we're a slave to sin, the, the master is keeping us enslaved to sin. So it can't be God he's paying it to, because God's not keeping us enslaved to sin. Well, it must be Satan. So Satan gets a payoff. No, that makes sense. So tons of this thinking, which is all legitimate, um, you might not think about. Because all these different emphases, that, emphasis, there's another one called the, the um, in the medieval times, called Christus Victor. And that focuses on the fact that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil over darkness. And there's the satisfaction theory, and then there's the governmental theory. They don't all say that it's all about God's anger against our sin. So if that's all you think it's really all about, you might want to look at those other ones and see whether the biblical weight there means it's actually a don't overemphasize one at the expense of others. Because that's what we do, isn't it? We, ex we, we, we emphasize things because we don't really know much about other stuff. But where's Jesus? Which one's he going to be in? The most. Well, I can tell you, it's wherever, wherever I am. <laughs> That's how unity, the prayer for unity, has been answered. Not through what we see or intellectually work out and adhere to and thinking, I've got it right now, and being loyal to God. There aren't. I'm going to argue against them and just entrench. That's what happens instead of listening. Instead of listening. So Jesus, somehow, his prayer has to be answered. And it's humbling. So let's just move on. What's the one thing which determines genuineness of following Jesus in any of those? It's the love of Christ, the new command. By this all men will know that you're my disciples. And that's tough love as well. It, do, it doesn't say anything goes. It resists the type of behavior and stuff which is anti-Jesus, anti-world, anti-creation, whatever. But that can manifest itself in all of these other ones. But the problem is it's not the benchmark. The only way you can really measure yourself, whether the, the tradition that you've bought into that you want to follow, whether it works, whether it's all authentic, is to check out the magnitude of the love of Christ in you. Whether you rejoice always, pray, continue, give thanks in all circumstances, as you're, you know, every now and again says, mourn with those who mourn and things. There are going to be times and moments and seasons, but generally speaking, we don't have short seasons of joy in amongst our normal season of pressure. Here's another one. You'll have rest for your soul if your tradition and the way you practice it is right, because Jesus said it. He said, learn from me, I'm humble of heart, gentle, humble of heart. You'll find rest for your soul. Put down your burden, yoke to me, because my yoke is easy, my burden is light. So do you feel you've got rest for your soul? These aren't the ways people measure of faithfulness to Jesus. It's all whether you believe this doctrine, you can recite this creed, whether you can go through that. None of that really determines our character and how our stance is towards other human beings. And of course, the real test is, do I bear the fruit of the Spirit as the norm of my character? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, most of the time, if not all the time. That's the real test of what you believe. Not how vigorously you can argue it. Because I'm guilty of getting into theological arguments with people who think different from me. And if truth be known, all I want to do is win the argument not learn and grow. But then that's all about division, isn't it? That's all back in the garden. That's all about separation. So let's move on. Even Paul admits it. Even though he says, whatever you hear me say, whatever you see me do, put it into practice. 
And then he says something, for now we see only in ref uh, reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I'm fully known. And there we have the relationship side of things, the presence of the living God in us that Jesus talks about in terms of that unity, I in you, you in me. That is the litmus test on the, the potency of our belief systems. <laughs> At the end of Romans 11, he's just gone through this epic, epic explanation of the gospel. Epic. Looking at it from all different angles. And he gets so carried away at the end, he goes into praise. And he's just explained stuff, anticipating how people might argue, so it's quite detailed and comprehensive in places. But he ends up with this. Oh, the depths of the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his path beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. Everything. To the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. To him be the glory forever. Paul had a massive perspective. So... Let's finish with a couple of diagrams. The second one will just use some of the text from the, 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 our, our text that we're looking at today. And I hope this helps us. It might raise questions, well, what about this and what about that? But fair enough, you'll have to go and work that out. So, blood and death. You know, that's what Moses said. I set before you life and death to dear when, when the law was the focus of blessing, blessings and curses, but life and death. And we have humanity withdrawals from God in the garden. Okay? And as soon as the withdrawal happens from God and the decision to make decisions on division, what's right and what's wrong, good and bad, and all the rest of it, rather than trusting in God, the whole of humanity is heading like a super tanker or a juggernaut towards death. And of course, down here... You might want to go into the New Testament witness about you know, eternal destruction, about the second death, whatever that might be down there. But God said, if you eat of the plant, the fruit of the knowledge you're going to, you'll surely die. And they didn't drop dead on the, on, the on, the, uh, on the point, did they? But death. And what is that? All the caustic human emotions and activities which are anti-God. All the ones that seem right or whatever, no, then no, then they don't conform to God. Not as rules so much as the fact it's, like Jesus said, look, it's not what you touch and stuff makes you clean. It's, it's what comes out of your heart that makes you unclean. And since out of the mouth comes what's really stored up in the heart. So that's, and we're all in there, you and me, careering towards destruction. And as God says, this is the revelation of his wrath. God's wrath is being revealed against all God ungodliness. And what is that? Is that a bit of smiting? No. It says God gave us over to the behavior that we choose to do. And then there's some described. His wrath, turns out, is to let us do what we want. <laughs> that doesn't seem like wrath. That wouldn't be the case if you were a kid, your parents with your kids. But that's God's wrath. You want to know about the, the anger and the fear of the Lord and all the rest of it? Think about that passage in 1 Romans. The wrath of God is allowing us to exercise our freedom of choice. So what's going to happen? Well, for us in Adam, all die. Because all have sinned. One trespass resulting in condemnation for all people because all sin. See this all thing again? This is epic. Everybody's included. But then what do we have? Well, down here, where are we headed? The culmination, the sum, the climax of all human anti-God activities, thoughts throughout the whole of history. That's the final thing. Down there, 
in the, the norm, this is not very good, this isn't what God created, but we want it. The, the, that's, the, that's the rubbish in your life. It's everything you thought, said, and did that, that really isn't light and life and goodness. It's killed, steal, and destroy. All those, like Megan said, people with low self-esteem, worried, easily offended, you name it, from all of the subtle stuff right down to the murder stuff and all of the, the big stuff, dictators and everything. All that human sin... Yours and mine, down there. Okay? And God's letting us have it. But he doesn't want to let us have it. It's got to be dealt with. It affects the creation. It's, we're dragging the whole of the cosmos, seen and unseen, down into that depth with us. Because we're choosing to do that. We've set ourselves up as God to every time you think you know better than what God says in his word, and it's not a humble, oh, I don't think the interpretation's right. It's just that, well, that's rubbish. What sort of God is that? <laughs> You're doing what Adam and Eve did. You're just showing them family traits. But it's not just our planet. It's the whole of the cosmos, seen and unseen, that the human race, and it says the whole of creation is groaning, waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. So that the, that free, it goes on to talk about so that the creation be, can come into the freedom of the children of God. This is massive bird's eye view. Does your tradition manage to cope with this? You know, is it big enough? So what happens? God's got a plan. Starts with a pagan called Abraham, works out a nation. He's going to work through a nation. That nation turns out to be worse than the other nations in some places. It says it that they even turn away from God. And he says, look, people don't ever exchange their gods for others, but you are just turning away. So a nation which would be used to represent us all. And so what happens? You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Everyone. Your husbands and wives, your children, your neighbors, everyone. Every single person that's ever lived. Every single person. And what happens? Jesus comes down. And he goes down to the depths. And he takes upon us all your gammy thinking about yourself, which is darkness. All the gammy thinking you've thought about others. All the activities that you've been a victim of. All of the activities where you've made somebody else your victim. Everything. Everything that's down in that darkness had to be taken upon God by a human being. God had to do for us what we couldn't do as a human being. And so he took on the likeness of sinful flesh, yet without sin, that could be killed and beaten and bruised. So all of our anti-godness was manifest on the day of crucifixion, where his own people, full of wrath and anger against this man, turned out to be wrath and anger against God. The ultimate, kill God. That will free us up so that we can do our own thing forever. Not realizing that Jesus dying on the cross because he was sinless. Not only like divine blotting paper, he soaks into himself the worst of humankind. Everything, you just take this into account. Not only thousands of years and generations worth of, of all of that anti-God stuff, but all of the stuff that was yet to come, yours and mine. On himself. That's why the passion of the Christ film, for all of its merits, falls short because it tries to put across the physical suffering as the thing which made the difference. Not really alerting us to the fact that thousands of people, most of them probably innocent, experienced the same physical abuse. No, Jesus went down. He went down further. And if you think he took your punishment that was everlasting damnation and punishment, well, he's not there anymore. So if you just think it's an exchange, that's the punishment. If your doctrine was right, then he'd still be in that place experiencing your um, punishment, wouldn't he? But he's not. There's something bigger going on. There's something much bigger going on that's the whole of the cosmos and the whole of creation. And I put it to you, 
that our experience of life and the world and humankind over the last two, three years has shown that we are no further on than our forebears. No further on at all. So Jesus has drawn us out of the darkness. He died for all. And the cross and the empty grave, get that one going up, and he comes out to take humanity and turn humanity back to God. I implore you, be reconciled to God, because that's what he's doing. And God's working through Christians as if it's God speaking, the ministry of reconciliation. So in Christ, all will be made alive. Also, so also righteous, so one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all. These are the, this is the symmetry in the Bible. I'm not a universalist. There will be people clearly that do not receive that re um, reconciliation. They will experience the grace of God in vain. But I know that might make you twitchy, the word all. Oh, don't go down that line. Because your tradition might actually mean some. But not all traditions actually mean some. A lot of traditions out there, they can quite, they can quite happily cope with the all, plus the fact that there will be people that will remain forever enemies of God. By the way, this is epic. The gospel you believe and follow is the one you tell people and reveal to them. And if it's distorted in some way, and it's not such good news as it actually is, it might not have the impact you desire. But then it might not have the impact as you desire on your life, which might be why you don't rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances. Because it's a small one. It's not a bird's eye view one. So, oh, I can't see up there. It says, Jesus has made one new humanity out of the two, the Jews and the non-Jews. So, time's getting on. <laughs> just quickly go through this. So let's just look at some of the texts. So, if anyone is in Christ, new creations come, the old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God, not from us. Not of yourselves, Paul says in chapter 2 of um, Ephesians. Who reconciled us to himself through Christ? Whether you live it and believe it or not. Yeah? Does that make sense? Otherwise, you've got to distort that somehow. You've got to change it so that God reconciled some or only a few. And then you've got to deal with the all. I hope you're getting confused. Because <laughs> I was confused. And I thought, oh my goodness, all of these beliefs out there. Why do I think I've got it nailed away? I certainly know that the beliefs that I've been hanging into for this can't really deal with this sort of stuff very well. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting sins against them. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And then over here, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. All of this, and however we settle down and what we believe, and it should humble us, and we should go, well, I can't get my head around the Trinity, and I can't quite get my head around all this either, because there seems to be contradictions. This is the most robust Christian witness, not only about the human race, but the whole of the creation, the environment because it includes the environment, because the environment is suffering from the wrong, ungodly thinking and behavior of human beings. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we no longer do. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. Anybody you look at, Christ has died for them. Christ loves them more than anybody could imagine, certainly more than we do. The grace of God is bearing down upon them. God has reconciled himself to them. They need to wake up to that so that that activity is not received in vain. It's better than thinking, well, God's back here and they have to do something, which do they do it enough? There is n you, God didn't leave any component in salvation down to our will. It, 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 it can't be, because if you say it's by faith, how much faith? I don't know about you, but some days I feel I'm full of faith, and otherwise I didn't. It was like Nikki earlier. And then you get one tradition going, oh, well, that, that means you've fallen away. This is, well, well, saved, unsaved, saves, unsaved. There is only one foundation. 
It's massive. Absolutely massive. And yes, if you read the Bible with humility, with an open mind, you will find challenging contradictions. Please don't go down any line where you're in a tradition that just wants to dig in and criticize anybody that thinks differently. You don't need to. Because it says even if you build with straw and stuff and it's all going to get burnt up, you'll still get saved. It's not about our works. Christ is everything to you and your neighbors and your children and the hope is mind-blowing. Let's pray. Lord God, Lord, I've been seeing people's faces with eyebrows being raised, and I know because I've been in that place when I was studying. And Lord, we've got visitors here from all over the place, and when this goes online, I could get all sorts of stuff coming down as the heretic hunters want to come out and start saying, oh, no, this, that, and the other. Lord, I just leave this over to you in your spirit to impress on our hearts that which is life in all of its fullness and giving us the courage to hear what you're saying, and for that unambiguous revelation that as we grow in our understanding, you will become more and more amazing in what you've done. So, Father, we pray that as we finish now and have coffee a little bit later or whatever, Father, whatever each one of us and where we're at in our walk, that something said today, maybe not all of it, but something said today, like a burr, will just attach itself to us and it would marinate and work in us so we would be transformed by the renewal of our mind. That we wouldn't be like all of those people that Paul wars against. You can't taste, you can't touch. Going back to the law rather than grace. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.